Man, I just, the more as time goes on, the people that come up and talk to me, I'm just blown away. I'm blown away. I'm blown away. I'm blown away. And I just, uh, oh, somebody pinch me. Is this actually happening? And I know I'm going to keep saying it because it just gets better and better and better. I came in on Tuesday afternoon. As a matter of fact, it was, it was, I'm, I'm just outside of South Bend, Indiana, just south of South Bend. And it's about an 11 and a half hour drive. And it got to be about 1.30 in the morning, Monday, Tuesday, it was Tuesday, a.m., 1.30 a.m. on Tuesday. And Robbie and I were talking, I was like, dude, we got so much to do. We got to, we got to do this, we got to do that. That's my Robbie impersonation. <laughs> hey, what's going on, man? How you doing? So I brought all these backdrops with me, had everything shipped to my place so that it'd be easier if I just drove it down and a lot cheaper. It was like two grand. If anybody wants to make money, get into logistics and ship from Canada to the United States because you can charge a lot of money. So we had everything shipped to my place so I could drive uh, everything back down here. So anyway, long story short, I was so excited that I'm like, I've got to crash for, you know, I've got to crash before I take off driving, man. 1.30 a.m. on Tuesday. I was down here by 3 p.m. on Tuesday. I couldn't go to bed. I was so excited to get here. that I just, I packed everything up and grabbed some caffeine and hit the road. About 35 minutes into the drive, I was like this. What am I doing? So the windows went down 42 degrees and I never looked back. I stopped twice. Only peed my pants once, but I made it. It was a rental car, so we're good. Is Hopkins in the house? Astronaut diapers. Astronaut diapers. I'm going to invest in a catheter next time. What's that? Drink it. Yeah, Dave Moore, where are you at? I'm going to heal myself. All right, here we go. Um, this guy, very, very just crucial in so many videos and, and learning. And once again, it goes back to this common denominator that we all have this thing now that we just can't shut this off. We want to learn, we want to learn, we want to learn. And uh, I can say this, Richard Hopkins is one of those guys that I caught myself watching a lot and going, hmm, okay, cool. Plus his name was catchy from, I, I do marketing. So when somebody has something that rhymes, I love it, especially when it makes sense. And I can't say enough about this guy. So I won't. I'll let him do his thing. But Richard Hopkins is also known as Mr. Thrive and Survive. So come on out, Richard. Here we go. I can't wait. If he's here, where'd he go? That's John Gabrielson. Is he, is, he, is he still talking? That's the other thing, too. We go out there and we get... You, get, you see somebody like, hey, I'm coming, over, I'm coming your way to talk to you. And you hit three or four people, but here he goes. Richard! Thanks, Rich. Thanks, Rich. Howdy, everyone. Howdy. People everywhere, huh? Well, it's good to see everybody here in Raleigh. Uh, I've been looking forward to this for quite a while. And uh, I was going to have this nice high-tech presentation for you, and I got on the plane and rewrote my whole thing. So the reason for that is I think we've come to a part where we have to realize that you guys in the audience are the next phase of this movement, if that's what you want to call it. Uh, there's been, what, a few dozen people, generally speaking, uh, who have been online, YouTube, Facebook, whatever, uh, who have done videos and some work and things like that. But for the most part, we're individuals working separately. And if anybody has ever been, in, for example, in a business or other group session where you get four or five or even more people together, or even just two, and you go back and forth with different ideas and brainstorming and things like that, you suddenly become geniuses where nobody in the whole group by themselves would be a genius by themselves. I don't think any of us are geniuses either. We just decided to look. So I think to keep this going, I think a lot of people can probably realize we're in sort of a transitional phase here where 
the brand newness of the, the whole flat earth idea is not quite as fresh and that, that new car smell anymore. So to keep it going and to expand it out into the rest of the universe of the earth uh, is to get people like you to get together and I think we need to have somebody come up with some sort of repository or depository uh, where everybody can put their evidences, their empirical evidences together uh, so that it stacks up as high as a mountain so that anybody anywhere who sees it uh, can, you know, come to the conclusion that you have. It, it's, there's nothing better than bringing people to the truth. Nothing. And that's why we're so passionate about it. Um, so what I wanted to do is I'm going to go over a whole bunch of different empirical evidences that I and others have come up with in the last couple of years. I want to start with, uh, for the people that are not familiar with me, how I got into believing that the earth was flat uh, and just go from there and give you some ideas of out-of-the-box thinking that I'm talking about that will come together if you get together as a group of people uh, to do this. And maybe those of us who have been doing this online or whatever, we can find ways uh, to get together and, and have group conversations uh, to come up with more. Now, recently, I've been involved with a group on YouTube called the Sun and Moon Group. It's very small. There's only a couple thousand people that are subscri subscribed to it. But there's some real genius uh, in the group and what comes together when people uh, combine their forces together. So that, that's the sort of the idea. But let's go down some of the things uh, that led me to where I am today and hopefully where we can lead others. Uh, I want to start with uh, some of my background. I started uh, as a four or five year old, very interested in anything science, but particularly earth science, uh, weather in particular. I was always a, a weatherman from, from a small kid. Uh, by the time I was a teenager, about 15, 16 year olds, years old, I remember my friend Rob who went into the Navy with me, he would tease me. He was like, what 16 year old is reading a book called Air Fluid Dynamics? And uh, I'm not going to pretend to know the math that was in it at the time anyway. I, uh, at that time, uh, I'm dating myself, but in high school in the, in the 70s, you didn't generally get past Algebra 2. Uh, in the 12th grade, and you know, that's taught now, I think, in maybe middle school, but um, by the time you got to air fluid dynamics, you're talking about a lot of quadratic equations and beyond uh, that. So I, I didn't know the, the math, but I was so interested in the earth science that it propelled me into other things. I was into model rocketry. I also uh, did chemistry experiments. Uh, you know, observation. That is what empirical evidence is. Empirical evidence is simply observation, which you observe with your senses. Now, science wants to say, no, you have to have all this mathematics to prove things. Mathematics doesn't prove anything. It can't prove anything. All mathematics can do is explain a phenomenon. Mathematics can explain that things fall to the Earth at 9.8 meters per second squared, but it can't tell you if it's gravity doing that or density buoyancy and magnetic force. All I can do is explain. And that's one of the things that we have to get people that are not into this uh, to understand. Little details like that. And we need to teach people to do more than just surface observations. And when I first saw the, uh, what's the guy's name, Norwicki, who took the picture of Chicago. Many of you, I'm sure, have seen this, the picture of Chicago from 60 miles. That's what got me into the Flat Earth movement. It was on Jaring's channel. Uh, I was, my channel had nothing to do with Flat Earth. It had to do with uh, uh, economic collapse, prepping, different things like that. And I happened to see, you know, YouTube on the side has the feed of other videos. They had a weatherman, obviously a weatherman, standing in front of a picture which I wasn't sure about the, you know, how little it is that it was Chicago, but I clicked on it just because it was, I wanted to see what this weatherman was talking about with a city in the background. And as soon as I saw it, and their, their explanation that it was a superior mirage, and I'm leaving out a little bit here, I was in the Navy for four years. I was professionally a weatherman in the Navy uh, on the USS John F. Kennedy. So being out at sea and being a weather observer for years, I know what a superior mirage looked like. And that picture was not a superior mirage. Uh, now, I just recently searched for that picture once again, and they do have somebody who has taken a picture with superior mirage of Chicago. 
And what's interesting is you can see how it's upside down, it's faded, it's kind of transparent, translucent looking. But also you'll notice if you look closely at the bottom of even this picture, real small, you can see that there's Chicago at the bottom, the whole works that, you know, the Norwiki picture was greatly um, zoomed in so that you could actually see the buildings, you know, almost down to the bottom. But when I saw that and with the, I've, I've always thought logically, I couldn't come up with anything else, and trust me, I was trying to come up with something else that could explain it. Uh, it took me a long time to build up 2,500 subscribers on my channel uh, into the prepping movement and things like that, and I knew this would, if I announced this, I was rapidly going to lose probably most of them, and I have. They're, as far as I know, they're all gone. Maybe two or three are there from the very beginning. Uh, in fact, the very first thing was, Rich, you better drop this because people are going to lose confidence in you. And my thing is, I got to go with the truth wherever it takes me. And that's just the way it is. <laughs> now, unfortunately, I'm a little ashamed that I didn't come to Flat Earth through the Bible because I thought I really knew the Bible well, but I did what everybody else does. I cognitive dissonance myself on certain verses, meaning, you know, thinking, uh, what well, it has to mean something else, or it's not exactly probably the right translation. Uh, the bottom line there is, if anybody has any doubts, go to Joshua 10 and read there and see that the sun stood still and the moon stood still. And with both of them, With both of them standing still, you can't have a Gil Prasad theory that God somehow caused Nibiru to pull the earth down 20 degrees or 30 degrees so that Israel would have a longer day. I'm sorry, but the moon would not stand still in that case. The moon is supposedly rotating around us, correct? So even that has a lot of flaws to it. So let's start getting into a few things. Oh. Speaking of cognitive dissonance, I wanted to go back and I was looking that up and I happened to come across once again, how many people have seen the video where in the 1960s at the end of um, the, the broadcast day, it's not like it is today, in the 1960s at 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night, whenever the local news ended on television, they would play the national anthem. And at the bottom it would say, oh say, can you, you know, you would have the words. And how many have seen the subliminal that was put into that? Oh, many of you, good, very good. Um, it would say, uh, the, the words actually, when you really slow it down, would say, trust the government. The government is God, that type of thing. You can search that, just search on Google for subliminals in uh, the national anthem, it'll pop right up, you'll see it. And there's some, several very good videos out there. And I decided to, decided to scroll down and see the comments and the very first comment with like 29 thumbs up, and it wasn't that popular of a video, was, oh, this isn't true. The CIA, uh, because at the end of it, it said MK Ultra, except it didn't have the MK, it had Ultra, and then some other code word that later came out was the secret CIA code words for it. The person wrote in the, in the thing that this, this isn't true because the CIA wouldn't put their secret code name up there, so this isn't true. The government never did that. This is a perfect cognitive dissonance response for someone who hasn't done any research whatsoever. This particular event with this commercial came out in congressional hearings in the 1970s where the CIA admitted they were using subliminals. What was the result? They promised not to do it again. <laughs> the spineless Congress did not pass a law stating you can't do it, so they settled for a promise. So do you think they're not doing it anymore for us? If it was good then, I'm sure it's good now. So I think that's a good example of cognitive dissonance and what most people have had because most people do not want to believe that they've been fooled. But I think the empirical evidence when we get here is going to show that there's so much of it. And I've looked at so little. One human being can only do so much. And I implore each of you I walk my dog twice a day, early in the morning at sunrise and at sunset. I have seen so many miracles. I actually prayed for them, though. Uh, crepuscular rays that 
come out and then come back together over top of me. All kind of weird things. Rainbows that lasted till past sunset where I actually could see them coming towards me. I thought at first it was getting bigger, but it was actually moving towards me. And I actually took pictures on my phone to record it, which means the sun was getting further away as the rainbow was moving. Now, the rainbow in particular is a very good uh, example, and I'm skipping around here a little bit, but the rainbow was a perfect example of science not telling us truth. Science admits that a rainbow cannot be created indoors unless you have two reflectors. It's got to have two indoors. So outside, we know rain is one reflector. What's the other one? The dome. Yeah, sunlight off the dome. We don't see the sunlight directly. And there's other evidence we have of that as well, empirical and observational evidence. The ball earth and a flat earth both cannot explain why on the equinox dates we see sunrise within a degree or two all over the earth at 090 degrees and sunset within a degree or two of 270 degrees on the equinox dates. Now, if you, I did a video where I held a glass up and said, if the light is on the other side, and I put the sun on the other side of the glass, and I moved my head back and forth, meaning you're moving on the earth, south and north, the sun would follow you the whole way. So when the sun gets into a certain position on the equinox states, if you're looking at the sun through a reflection, not directly, you will all see it at 090 degrees and 270 degrees. There's no other way to explain that that I know of. And there's other evidence that has come out from this eclipse, which I think is NASA's worst nightmare, this eclipse that just occurred in North America. And we're going to talk a little bit about that, too. Uh, how many people saw that just before the eclipse came out, that they ran a video saying, you're going to see all these little, what they said, pinpricks that were going to cause these images of the moon on, uh, the, or the, the images of the eclipse cast on the ground. Has anybody seen those pictures? Okay, look those up. They're amazing. Thousands and thousands of pictures of the eclipse, whatever phase it was in, being cast onto the ground at one time. Now, NASA, two or three days in advance, yeah, they've been covering eclipses for what? Since they were here in 1945, 50, whatever they were invented or put together. And we've never heard this. But what they realized this time was now we have P900s, which is Flat Earth's greatest tool. Uh, we have P900s, and they know people were going to be observing this. And people, there's enough people out there now questioning the, the official narrative to where we would notice it. So they tried to get out in front of that. And they said, well, it's just little pinpricks. Well, there's a couple problems they have with that. that and those are some of them stack one on top of the other. And where they stack, they're brighter. Not all of them are at the same angle. Some of them are slightly off one way or the other. So pinpricks through leaves, which is what they said caused it, will not cause that. Uh, observations from balloons that were in the air, 75,000 feet at the time of the eclipse, showed orbs in front of the sun that were doing the exact same thing. They were overlapping one another. They would cause like Vesica Pisces type of overlaps and stacks, those exact same things, empirical evidence would tell you that at least there's a chance that is what's being cast to the earth. Pinholes don't explain it. So let's take a look at some of these things here. Oh, the other thing too is, how many people have heard it's settled science? And how many, you know, it, the earth is a spinning ball, it's been settled for 400, 500 years. You know, our science, we, have to, we have to look at everything, guys. Everything is a lie. Someone on the Sun and Moon group did a search uh, online and found a newspaper article. I think it's 1903. I could be a couple years off, but circa 1900 in England. And in the newspaper, a person, in fact, let me actually read it to you. Schools of Portsmouth in the Kingdom of England this is a quote now, have been teaching the damnable and heretical doctrine that the earth is a sphere. So this is 1903. They're teaching a heretical doctrine that the earth is a sphere in England. They go on to say it's called seditious and treasonous doctrine. Uh, the person's name, uh, a taxpayer, 
you know, we all pay taxes for the schools, right? Ebenezer Breach was his name, a taxpayer, called attention to the matter. And I'm quoting again, quote, Ebenezer and his friends know, of course, that the earth is flat as a pancake, corrupting their children. So this has not been settled science for 400, 500 years. It's been being taught in schools in the last 100 years. Now, we all know that we have revisionist scientists. Uh, scientists revision, we have those too, don't we? Uh, we have re revisionist science um, history with the Vietnam War, for example, the Gulf of Tonkin incident. Conspiracy theorists say there was a Gulf of, Gulf of Tonkin incident, of course, 25 years later when nobody cares. The truth comes out. That's what it was that caused the Vietnam War. It was a setup. And I could go on and on, but that's not what we're talking about here. So anyway, the Chicago picture forced me to go into the scientific method once again. Now, I'm not going to teach elementary school science, but let me give a little refresher. You basically have to start with a hypothesis. The hypothesis here is the Earth is a round spinning ball. But then you have a problem. If a problem arises with your, your law, your theory, whatever it is, then you have to explore and test and see if it holds up to the scrutiny. Well, the problem is with the picture, it appears that we saw way too much of Chicago for the Earth to be flat. I mean, for it to be a sphere. So the next step in the scientific method is to collect empirical data and perform experiments and controls and see what comes out. Again, these are done with our senses. There's nothing magical about needing a laboratory with $50,000 or $2 million worth of material. You can go out and see things with your eyes and hands and, and, and feel things and, and hear things. You don't have to know that a lightning bolt was near you if you just heard a loud clap of thunder. Uh, we can make these things from science, these conclusions. And again, if any contradiction to the evidence is found, then we need to change the law, theory, or theorem that science has come up with. Let's talk about gravity for a second. Gravity is the magic pill, isn't it? Why, why, why do they want, not want to get rid of it? Well, let's look at a couple of things with gravity first. Is there any exceptions to the rule? Gravity says that all things are attracted towards the center of the Earth, except for smoke, except for clouds, except for hot air balloons, except for helium, and on and on and on. Why does gravity not work with a wooden ship on the ocean? It's buoyancy and density. Why do things attract to the Earth? I personally believe, and we're getting into this in some of the advanced talks, that we need to look at everything as more a Tesla type of system than Einstein system. And what that means is, that we're getting into electromagnetics, dielectrics, and different things like that. They explain so much, and uh, one of the people that really is doing a great job with that, I've done two parts so far, I've got to finish it on my channel, is a guy named Chris Monk Seeley, who has come up with so much empirical evidence from the last eclipse. He's the one that discovered that there was nothing in front of the moon, I mean, in front of the sun. There was no moon there that blocked it. Mike Helmick, H-E-L-M-I-C, K, I think is what it's, how it's spelled. Check his channel out if you haven't seen his channel. He does a great job showing through f colors and different things like that, uh, uh, light spectrums, that the moon was not in front of the sun. It simply was not there. What blocked it is a, is a deep story that I won't get into. So let's get into some of the empirical evidence we have looked at uh, since I've gotten into it anyway. Um, so if there's no, if the Earth is flat, it's obviously not spinning, because that would cause all kind of issues. Um, and again, it's not um, settled science. Now I could put a chart up here. I could do a famous little PowerPoint chart that I hate. That's why I rewrote this. I just hate PowerPoint, guys. Sorry. Uh, I don't know why I have an inversion to it, but I do. But I could put a chart up here and say, here's all the evidence we have that the Earth is not moving, and that it's flat. But let's stick with the moving part. And then I could put on the other side, what does science say about the Earth moving? Nothing. They have given us no 
practical examples other than you see the stars move at night and the sun and moon move, that's proof that the Earth is spinning. But that's a 50-50 proposition. Either it's moving or we, we are moving. Now, when you're out at sea, and many of you have experienced this in a car or whatever, and you have something move and you have no reference point, you're not sure if you're moving or it's moving. You might slam on the brake because you think you're drifting. You ever had that experience? Relative motion, exactly. So what do you do? You have to, if you're out at sea and you see a boat going around you, how do you know if you're the one moving or the boat is moving? With no other reference, of, and trust me, you, you see that all the time out at sea. You have no distant reference point, especially if it's foggy and cloudy, no sun. You have to put your hand in the water. And we have somebody that actually did that, and I'll get to that in a second, so to speak. We have Michelson-Morley experiments, Sanyak, uh, other Michelson experience, uh, experiments, Michelson-Gale and others who came up with him. These are experience, uh, experiments done in the 1800s, late 1800s, which showed, without a doubt, that the Earth does not move. Now, you'll get people that'll dig in and say, no, they were trying to prove that the ether exists or doesn't exist. No, get in and dig and read what it really says. They were using infra, uh, what is it, interferometers and different things like that, how light moves when you put motion to it. And that's why Einstein became such a genius and he was elevated. Because he said, well, they can't really tell because it just so happens that the light expanded at just the right amount of time or just the right amount of space so that they couldn't tell if the Earth was moving or not. Okay, so how do you get around that? This is where I get with thinking outside the box. Or someone named George Biddle, Airy, Airy's failure. He came up with a way to put your hand in the water. He's the one that came up with a telescope. If you ha haven't heard of Airy's failure, this is a must. You must learn Airy's failure. I have done a video on it. Others have done videos on it as well. What he discovered was that starlight and looking through a telescope, they don't line up. If you look through the viewfinder and then try to find it in the piece of the telescope, and trust me, having a telescope, this happened all the time. You'd have to tilt the telescope a little bit more to get it in the telescope with the greater power. And the reason is, is because either we are spinning, causing the light to be bent slightly, or the stars above us are moving past us. And what he decided to do was fill the telescope with water. Water greatly reduces, doesn't reduce it to zero, but it greatly reduces the speed of light. And what he determined was, and what he was expecting was to debunk Michelson, Morley, Michelson, Gale, Sinek. He was trying to debunk all of those. Because his experiment resulted in the opposite, it, it, the, he, didn't, he no longer had to make an adjustment or he continued to have to make an adjustment for the light, which meant, I know this probably doesn't make sense if you're not familiar with that because I'm not getting into great detail. The conclusion was the earth does not move. Now, he wanted his paper published, so he left that out, which is one of the critics' complaints. Oh, he didn't say that the conclusion was that the earth didn't move, but that's what he was testing for. But he wanted it published, so he just left that blank. And it was published and it was written up. But Aries failure, it's a very cheap and expensive experiment. And you can trust it's been done over and over again to failure again. But that is the best experiment to date that shows the Earth does not move. And nobody hears about it. There are many people online who attest to have gotten engineering degrees, physics degrees, different things, astronomical degrees, and have never heard of these experiments. They might have heard of Michelson, Morley, and Michelson, Gale, and things like that, but the reason why they heard about that, oh, Einstein debunked that. Well, Einstein also said that if the speed of light was ever found not to be a constant, that his theory, by necessity, was wrong. And the speed of light is not a constant. We know it is moving. It's, it, it's, there's some cases where it slows down, some cases where it's not inhibited as much, but over time it has been slowing. By Einstein's own definition, his theory is bunk. And yet that's what we're told today. It's Einstein, Einstein, Einstein. Because just like gravity, it's the magic bullet. It gets rid of the other experience, experiments that people have done with light.
Now, the other magic with gravity is, of course, that this is why they can't get rid of it and go with It's simple. Go with density, buoyancy, and magnetic attraction. It explains everything. What do we get? We get Neil deGrasse Tyson coming out with a microphone and dropping it. And that's settled science to prove that that's gravity. Please. Is it what we pay people hundreds of thousands a year to do? Drop microphones? All right, so we got the problems with cosmology, two of them. If we don't spin, if, we don't, if we're flat, we definitely don't spin. The other proof we have that we're a ball, I have to give them credit, is all the pictures, what, eight or nine of them, of the Earth, <laughs> that they admit are CGI, and no two are a match. I did one video where I actually took the width of Florida and made that my measuring stick and found out, I think it was seven widths of Florida to get to the western edge of the Gulf of Mexico from the eastern edge, from the western edge of Florida to the eastern edge of the Gulf of Mexico. It took seven widths of Florida in that picture. In the next picture, I think it took four and a half. <laughs> so the Gulf of Mexico dry up and shrink. Did Florida move west? And we're just supposed to believe that even though it's CGI and we have to do it that way, isn't that what they said? By necessity, we have to do it that way. We're supposed to believe that America expands and contracts at about a 40% rate over years. <laughs> but this is what we get. And nobody in the mainstream questions it because of cognitive dissonance, which is what we need to change. Now, there's something on the side I'm going to talk about here in a minute. Uh, I'm calling it a clitopause, and this is what I want to look into. It. And the only reason I'm bringing it up now is because it's on my mind. How many people notice that you get this shadow during the eclipse? It keeps moving, 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 moving. It gets right over the sun and stops. And it sits there, and it sits there, and it sits there. And then it starts moving again. Except if it came in at 2 o'clock, it doesn't go out at 8 o'clock. It might come in, drop down, and go back out at 10 o'clock. It comes in like it's on a pendulum. What in cosmology explains that? Nothing that I know of. Another interesting thing about the eclipse is that in Arizona, Phoenix, where I'm at, the eclipse basically did come in from the top left and move down to the bottom right. Just two or 300 miles south of where I am in Mexico, it was flipped. And there's video of it. It came in the other way. How is that possible? I don't know a way to explain it. I really don't. But these are things we need to look in. And these are like anecdotal little things to throw in over the side. So let me give you some of my walking my dog Charlie experiments. Have you noticed that the seas, what they call the seas on the moon, which are black at night? They turn blue during the day. How is that possible? Not only that, but when you have a waning moon, and this happens a lot when my dog gets me up about 5 a.m. right at sunrise, you go out and you see the moon, it's still close to full, but it's setting. And the sun comes up, and by the end of the walk, I can barely see the moon because it has faded. It becomes transparent. I saw actually a time-lapsed video, I meant to capture it, but I missed it, of someone who actually showed that. It showed a nice solid moon, but as it went and the sun was coming up, it, got, it faded more and more and more until you, you just couldn't see it anymore. And it was still obviously in the sky. It hadn't reached sunset point. Weird stuff that we need to look at. So it does become transparent or it appears to be transparent or translucent at times. Here's another thing I brought up recently. I started noticing light and shadow because the heat in Arizona forces your walks at sunrise and sunset. And I started noticing that colors can be seen still after sunset for quite a while, even to the point where you can barely see your shadow. You can still make out certain bright greens and reds and things like that. But moonlight at night, even when it's much brighter, when there's a very sharp defined shadow, I can't see colors anywhere. There are no colors to be found. It's got to be a different light. It can't be just a reflection of the sun. We know that if you take color, spectrography, 
I hope I'm saying that right, images of the moon, it falls into the silver spectrum, which is blue. It comes from the blue spectrum. It's silver light coming from the blue spectrum. The sun is yellow coming from the red spectrum. How is it a reflection? We also have many people, including myself, who have done experiments that I say the moon actually cools, but at worst, it doesn't heat a damn thing. Okay, it just doesn't. One of the th there's a couple out-of-the-box things with that. I did an experiment that I didn't re even realize the video would become that, that famous, but it was on different news sites where it was the first one I did where I laid a, a simple wallet out, a black wallet, and I laid it out on the ground, and five feet away from it, I, cre I put down a box that would block the moonlight that was coming down to it. And so half, I put half the moonlight, half the uh, wallet in, in the light, half in... in uh, in the moonlight and half in the dark. And when I took a laser thermometer to one side, it was much cooler than the other side. The moonlit side was cooler. Granted, it wasn't the best controlled system, but it was my first time. I was actually shocked. And I did it live and people told me, hey, we could tell in your voice, you, you were, I was, I was actually surprised that I was getting a lower temperature. And of course the cognitive dissonance kicks in because this was on a site where, how can we debunk this? And they said, well, he was probably 10 or 15 feet away, and his laser thermometers have, you know, by that distance, you have like a five-foot field, so he's not really getting it. Well, if they would just ask, it was about three feet from it. But then later, I did more experiments, more controlled, that I had learned growing up how to do controlled experiments, using different thermometers. I used electronic thermometers, digital thermometers, things like that. I found the same thing. At worst, no temperature change at best, four or five degrees cooler in the moonlight. So how can we prove this? Now, anecdotally, fire, firefighters have told us that at night when the moon is out, fires seem to rage more. And during the day when the sun is out, you would think it's the opposite, wouldn't you? The sun tends to dampen fires down. Fires tend to grow the most at night. So my friend Dave in Wales, I hope you're watching Dave, he came up with a nice idea he said, why don't we take candles, put them in a row, and see what happens. He took seven candles, he put them in a little box, a little like birthday candles, seven of them. And he set them, with, set them within certain two or three feet from a windowsill. So they were all equally exposed to cold or warmth from the window. Uh, and the outside at that time was pretty much the same as the inside temperature. It wasn't in the middle of winter or summer. So that wasn't a factor. But he had... it. In his windowsill, he had a wooden, uh, I don't know what it's called, sill or whatever, it comes down the middle that divided the window. And that created shade for one of the candles. So six of the candles were exposed to moonlight. One of the candles was in dark. And he let them burn, and he let them burn. And when he went back, he discovered something interesting. I'm calling it Rich and Dave's failure. We expected the moon candle to burn all the way down, and the other ones not to burn. Or, I'm sorry, we, the other way. We thought the ones, because it was cooler, moonlight, they wouldn't burn as fast, but they burned all the way down. In the moonlight, they burned all the way down. The one in the shade still had about 30, 35% of the candle left, the wax. How, that was our, I was like, oh, that's the opposite reaction, what we wanted. So we started doing some research, and lo and behold, when you study fire, when it's cooler, and people have actually done studies with candles, candles burn faster when it's cooler. It has something to do with the difference in the temperature. So it is true that the moonlight does cause fires to burn faster. That's one of the out-of-the-box things. It's a different way to look at the same problem. You don't need thermometers, but it's another evidence to throw on top of the thermometers. It's another witness. We know it takes two or three witnesses to establish anything, right? Another thing with the moon, now this isn't from observation because my eyes aren't that good, but about a year and a half ago, I started looking at the phases of the moon. You know, it's generally 28, 29 days to go from new moon back to new moon again. And I wanted to see what the rate of increase was. And you would think it'd be, okay, 3%, 3%, 3%, 3%, more each day, whatever the percentage would be. I think it is 3 or 4% is the average. But it's not. 
it might grow 1% the first day, 5% the second day, 3% the third day, 4%, 2%. It's all over the board. The whole time the moon is what I call charging and discharging. It's all over the board. Nothing in cosmology explains that. NASA's cosmology, anyway. Because the moon doesn't speed up and slow down, speed up and slow down as it's gaining phases. It has one speed up and one slow down, according to NASA, correct, as it goes around, and it's not even by that much. So that's something that, that needs to be explained. Here's the other thing. As bright as the moon is, let me, let me back up first. After sunset, notice for about an hour, well, it depends on what time of year it is, for about an hour, roughly, you can still see some blue in the sky. Even way on the other side, east, where the sun has long been gone, you can still see some blue in the sky. Even when it's, you can't even see your shadow, you can still see some blue in the sky. When the moon's up in full, you get a nice dark, uh, dark and light difference, nice shadows and things like that, much brighter than when the sun's way over the horizon, you see a blue sky. How come you see no blue around the moon? No blue around the moon at all. Has anyone ever noticed that? These are things we have to look at and note and put together for others. Now that may be nothing. They tell us we have to have enough light for our cones to be activated for color. They also told us different parts of our tongue were necessary, like you couldn't taste salt unless it was on the front of your tongue and things like that, but that all became false. What they do, finally test it? It's like how much lies, how many lies do we have to endure and go through? It's just something I throw out there as anecdotal evidence. I was going to get into the, some, of the, some more of the eclipse light darkness stuff, but I don't think I have time for that. All right, let's go. Back. Oh, one other thing. You know, they say that the moon is gravity locked <laughs> to the earth, meaning that we see the same face all the time. This is just something I thought about on the plane. You know, when I was growing up, I finally got a telescope powerful enough to where I could see the red spot on Jupiter. And as far as I can remember, looking in textbooks, there's always that red spot, usually just left of center on the lower part of, lower center part of Jupiter. You go online, you look at it, almost every picture, that's where it is. Is Jupiter locked to the Earth? Why do we always see the red spot? Does it never go to the other side? That, is, I don't know, it's just something I, I thought of. I was like, is Jupiter landlocked to the Earth? Is it a ball? Now, why do I not think the moon is a ball? Well, it doesn't act like a ball. A ball with light shining on it like the sun should have a bright spot in the middle. It doesn't. The edges should flare away from us and get darker. It doesn't happen. It acts as a flat disk. These are all observations, what science calls, calls observational data that you can use in the scientific method to prove something. Yet nothing that we, other than it being round like this, like a pie, we have no evidence whatsoever that the Earth, I mean that the Moon is a ball. I'm going to get into uh, sunspots. Some people are doing some brilliant work on sunspots. If you look at these suchy satellites and other stupid satellites that people can't tell. It amazes me people can't tell they're looking at CGI. These CGI images of the sun, and they always show sunspots on this side, and they just march across, don't they? And then supposedly they come back again. Well, we have people now all over the Earth who are taking observations, taking pictures with Flat Earth's best friend, P900 and other things, and they are following the sunspots. They found out two amazing things. The sunspots don't do this. They might start there, but they move towards the center. And then they move back out, and then back towards the center, and then they sometimes rotate around. They do not act like the Sechi satellites. And these are people all over the world observing the same thing. Many, many witnesses. Not only that, but they saw parallax with the spots. In other words, someone in Europe sees the spot a little bit farther right than someone in America, let's say. You might see it farther left. And they've taken the actual photographs of the sun at the exact same time and shown the parallax. That is impossible if it is 93 million miles away. You would not notice parallax from Europe to the United States. I'm sorry.
Here's another out-of-the-box thing. How many people have tried to point out crepuscular rays? By the way, my son Michael came to Flat Earth. He was always a denier. Uh, he was in the, uh, my backyard. We were talking about something else. And he looked up at the sun, and there happened to be a cloud right there at that time. And beautiful crepuscular rays came out. And he looked at me, and he said, how far did the science, and he doesn't, he's not into science. How far does science say that the sun is away? I said, 93 million miles. He looked back at it, looked back at me, and just did this. No way. <laughs> he used logic and common sense. He's now a flat earth believer. See, you don't know what it is that's going to trigger someone to finally see the light. But anyway, with crepuscular rays, there's, the cognitive dissonance is so bad, there was uh, someone in England was doing a video chat with people, even on the other side, and when they saw a picture of crepuscular rays, they insisted they were parallel. It's all perspective and it's parallel. That's how bad the cognitive dissonance was. So what I did was, and it, it's just something I happened to come across and see, I'm not any kind of genius. I found a picture of an airplane. Someone had taken pictures of clouds outside of an airplane. And it was close proximity, a bunch of cumulus clouds. And there was the sun that was conveniently hidden by one of the wings. And you could see in just a short space of time moving around that the shadows near the camera were almost coming directly on to the person. To the right, they were off to the right. The shadows were cast the other way. In other words, you'd have like six o'clock shadows there. On the other side, you'd have nine o'clock shadows. It absolutely showed, without a doubt, no crepuscular rays to look at, that there's no way to get around light and shadow. There's no perspective that will make you think that, oh, the shadow over here really isn't facing that direction. So that was another proof that the sun is close. Now, of course, we've seen many videos now of balloons that have shown hot spots on the earth, which is, again, another impossible thing. Speaking of balloons, there was one balloon launch I saw once that had this beep, 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 just all the way up. It was kind of annoying. And, but I started noticing that after a certain while, it was getting less and less and less, and it finally faded to nothing. And I realized, oh, there's not even enough air there to push the sound waves, let alone the balloon. Not even enough air to push the sound waves. And yet this thing's up there for 45 minutes at that altitude, not being pushed by anything. And it falls within six or seven miles of where it was launched. You know, the whole theory is that the atmosphere, the ground and the water all move together, which is an impossibility, by the way, because the atmosphere does not have any frictional force to it. It can't attach itself to the earth and keep spinning. It just doesn't happen. But that was, to me, a proof. Because in that amount of time, the earth would have rotated about, I can't remember what the exact number was, I think it was 1,500 miles underneath of the balloon. It didn't even have air to push it, and yet when it came back down, it was right you know, where the prediction would, would be, where the, the, the thing would land, based on upper air data. All right, let's take a look at a few other Observations, got a few minutes left. Meteor showers, this is one of my favorite ones. Now, I'm not one of those who thinks that just because the Earth is not moving, that you can't have things in space like comets and meteors. I don't deny that they may exist. But let's take their example here for a second. You have a comet that comes by, Kahootek, whatever, and it leaves these space rocks out there. That once a year, the Earth comes back around, gets in its path, and we get these meteor showers, like the Gemini meteor showers. That I think they're in the spring, and they come out of Gemini. They appear to come out of Gemini. Every year, we supposedly go around and come through this again. Why? Because these rocks are so small, they're not attracted by the Earth's gravity or the Sun's gravity. Well, wait a minute. We're supposed to be orbiting the Sun, which is moving at so many hundreds of thousands of miles per hour through space, and we're following it. And then every year we come back around to those same little rocks again, which would now be like 30 billion miles away. If they're not heavy enough to fall to the earth or be pulled to the sun, which satellites aren't, right? They need to be powered, so they say. 
how these little rocks stay in the same spot every year. No, it's the, the whatever you want to call the ether or space, whatever you want to call it, comes back, that part comes back around at the same time every year. This is an oldie but a goodie, the sidereal day and the 24-hour day. I don't care what people tell you, they have the excuse of the sidereal day. Every six months, the sun, and, uh, the sun would have to flip on the earth. You would have noon at midnight. There's no way around it. Now, what they'll say is, well, there's a sidereal day. Now, sidereal means star. The stars are actually four minutes lagging each day. But the sun and the earth are 24 hours precisely to the second. If the sun is over New York City, 24 hours later to the second, it will be at its highest point again. And 24 hours later, it will be at its highest point again over New York City. And then they say, well, each day there's a one degree movement since the earth was moving in its orbit that makes it up. No, for six months maybe, but the other six months it's turning the other way. So that's another proof that's just unbelievable that, that science even wants us to, to believe that. Plus, when you start thinking about how the moon phases are not affected by us going around the other side of the sun, it really starts getting crazy. Another out-of-the-box thing is, uh, you know, I could mention probably by now thousands of examples where people have said, there's a statue that's 200 miles away, I shouldn't be able to see it, but here's a picture of it. We have all this empirical evidence, and what do the deniers say? Oh, there's refraction, there's super refraction, this, that, and the other. Okay, fine. A brilliant video. I think it's called M Mountains of Proof. I'm not 100% sure, but I'll, I'll post it on my channel soon. I think it's called Mountains of Proof. A brilliant guy, uh, I believe in Virginia, uh, found four mountains, or actually three mountains, that had the same height, almost exactly, within five or 10 feet of each other. And they were generally spaced 10 to 20 miles apart, if I remember correctly. And he found a fourth mountain, which was a little bit higher, but he decided to go down to the same altitude as those other three. And these were basically bald mountains, which means there's no trees to throw the skewing off and things like that. Little shrubs, but that was about it. What he did was, now I'm just going to throw a number out there, he found three mountains, say 20 miles apart, roughly, that were at 2,000 feet elevation exactly. Now, picture looking down a rifle uh, barrel where you, get, you line up the sight. That was his idea. He went to the fourth mountain, went to 2,000 feet, and looked at the first mountaintop. And he said if the earth was curved, the other mountains would be hidden because they're farther away. They weren't hidden. They were the exact same height. They, they weren't exactly in line. They were staggered a little bit so you could actually see they were the exact same height. 30, 40 miles away, looked the exact same height as a mountain very close to him at 2,000 feet. That's another great out of the box. There's no refraction or super refraction included in all that. Plus, we have the biggie. Water is always flat. No exception to the rule. None. And I had one. I was kind. Uh, he's a decent guy. Was, was interviewing me. He said, yeah, but you have the meniscus. You know how it curves like this? And maybe that's what causes it. Well, I didn't interrupt him or say anything, but the meniscus actually goes this way with water. This is why you have to do your research. It's a concave. And then I say, well, when water falls to the ground, it's... It's a round, you know, it's round. Well, yeah, that's because air around it is forcing it into that shape. Once it ends its fall, and once air has stopped working on it, it's flat again, isn't it? Water is always flat. Plus, the meniscus in water doesn't hold water. Ocean water, that is. Salt destroys the surface tension meniscus of water. So you have these people who show these humps on the top of a cup, and say, see, it proves that you can have water do that. Not in the ocean. Drop some salt in there. See, see if you get that happen. It'll start leaking over the edge right away. Or put salt in it to begin with and fill it up and try to do that. It won't work because it destroys the surface tension. So I'll end it here. I have page after page after page of other stuff I could talk about, empirical evidence. But again, I implore each of you to form little groups, big groups, and let's move this out to the rest of the world. You know, there's nothing hidden that will not be exposed. We know that.
And this is the time, if you're smart enough to recognize it, you can be part of it. Let's help expose the truth. God bless each and one, every one of you. Thank you. Peck. Oh, I'm back. I uh, just want to, Rich, thank you so much. Mr. Thrive and Survive, one more time. <laughs> Looking forward to much more stuff from him. Uh, we're going to break for lunch, but before we get up, I just want to make an announcement. I'm going to start making more announcements because I, I feel really bad, and I just want to apologize to Rich because a lot of us were still in the lobby um, as his presentation started, so I humbly apologize uh, that that happened to him because I know there was a lot of distractions going on. So, But thank you again for that presentation. We've got more coming up. The guy that's responsible for waking a lot of us, a lot of us up uh, with some clues, Mr. Blue himself. I'm just kidding. I'm killing you. Yes. Um, I just want to say, I met him in the academy at the CIA and <laughs> we went to Mars together. Uh, but I will say this. Um, he's got a great sense of humor. He's dry. Uh, he's my guy. But Mark Sargent's coming up next after our break, and I just want to say uh, enjoy your lunch. At 2 o'clock is when we'll do this. So what we're going to do is we'll do it at 2. Um, we wanted to, we're running a little bit behind, but that's okay. Um, your lunch isn't going to be as long as you thought, so eat a little bit faster. And... Uh, What's that? Oh, you guys can't talk to my ear when I'm talking because then I start repeating what you're saying. It's not cool. I'm just kidding. Free food for everybody. No, but enjoy your lunch, and uh, we'll see you when you get back, and be safe. Blessings.